This beginner's course will help you learn HTML and CSS by building a real-world project. Madison Kana teaches this course. She is an experienced front-end engineer. She is excellent at breaking down things for beginners and explaining the fundamentals of web development. Hey everyone, I'm Madison, and today we're going to learn HTML and CSS by building an order summary component. This course is for complete beginners. If you don't know any HTML or CSS, then this course is for you. This course is also for you if you do know some HTML and CSS, but you want to cement your understanding of them by building something. By the end of this course, you will have a professionally designed project that you can use in your developer portfolio. Before I got my dream job working as a software developer, which is what I do now, I actually taught myself how to code using Free Code Camp. So I'm really excited to be here with you today building this. Let's just dive in and get started. The order summary component is a challenge from Frontend Mentor. In case you aren't familiar with Frontend Mentor, we'll talk for a second about what it is. If you're already pretty familiar with Frontend Mentor, you can just skip over this section. Frontend Mentor is a place where you can improve your coding skills by building professionally designed projects. Many of their projects are completely free, and today you won't be paying anything as we build this challenge. The main reason why I love Frontend Mentor is that you can build coding projects using professional designs. Each challenge on the site comes with starter files where you can see desktop and mobile designs of the app you're going to build. Today we're going to build this order summary component that we see here. The first thing you need to do is sign up for a free account on Frontend Mentor and start this challenge. Again, you won't be paying anything in this course. If you haven't already, go ahead and go to frontendmentor.io and sign up for your free account. Next, let's actually go to our project. Here's our order summary component. Before we talk about what an order summary component is, I want to talk a little bit about how websites work, and how we use HTML and CSS to build websites. Let's talk a little bit more about how websites work. Right now, you're likely using a web browser. So maybe you're using Firefox or Chrome or Safari. As an aside, in this course, I'm going to use Google Chrome. And you can use whatever web browser you'd like, but I suggest you use Google Chrome so you can follow along the course as closely as possible. Okay. You're using your web browser, and your browser's job is to interpret HTML and CSS files into a website that can be displayed for visitors. Every website that you go on today has HTML and CSS. Today, we'll write HTML and CSS, we'll put that HTML and CSS into files, and then the browser will interpret this HTML and CSS and display our site to us. All websites have files. These are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files, as well as other files like images that you see on the web. All of these files will determine how your website will look and act. Another part of websites is the server. The server stores all the files on a website. You can think of a server as just a computer that's connected to the internet and the server sends web files to the browser. These are two core pieces of websites, the server and the browser. The browser can also be called the client. When you build websites, you might be called a web developer, but there are also these terms called front-end and back-end developer. Let's talk real quickly about what these mean and how they relate to the client and the server. Backend developers focus on the side of a website that users usually can't see, the server side. Meanwhile, front-end developers focus on the visual elements of a website or app that a user interacts with. In other words, the client side. Front-end developers work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, among other tools, to build the front ends of websites. These are the fundamentals of how a website works. Let's talk a bit more about HTML. HTML is the foundation of all websites. HTML allows your websites to display text, images, videos, like anything you see on websites today. Front-end developers, such as me, use HTML and CSS to make websites look good. 
We also use other things such as JavaScript and other tools and frameworks, but that's a bit beyond the scope of this course. HTML is the foundation of all websites. HTML allows your website to display text, images, videos, anything you see on websites today. HTML alone might look ugly, but that's where CSS comes in. CSS styles your HTML. In other words, CSS makes your web page look nice. Front end developers like me use HTML and CSS to make websites look good. Now that we know some about how websites work and how we use HTML and CSS to build websites, let's go back and look at our order summary component. Your next question might be, what is an order summary component? Think about anything you buy on the internet. Chances are you landed on a page and you bought something and then you saw an order summary. Maybe you bought a movie on YouTube or you bought an online coding course from Udemy or maybe you bought a subscription to Spotify. Usually you will see an order summary that tells you either like what you're about to buy or what you bought already. So it's just a summary of your order and it might show how much money you're spending and things like that. For everything you buy on the internet, it's likely there is a web developer using HTML and CSS to build and style that order summary page that you were on. Now this project um, is not just called an order summary, it's actually called an order summary component. You might be wondering like, what is a component? A component can mean different things. For example, like a component in React can mean something different than a component in a different library or framework. However, for our purposes here today, we call this an order summary component because it's creating a piece of something. A component, in other words, is a building block. When a user goes and they see this component, they might see this data here that tells them what plan they've bought, but this data could change depending on the user. What doesn't change is this component that will always render the same view and the same HTML. The data, on the other hand, will be different. So this component could be used several different times. If we look at this design, uh, this kind of purple color in the background, this is the page, so maybe it's the web page that you're on after you've purchased something. And then this looks like kind of a card, and this is our component itself here. An order summary component is absolutely something that you might build when you start working as a developer. So you can add this project to your portfolio by the end of this course. If you want to have an extra challenge, I would say pause this video now and try to build the order summary component completely on your own. If you get stuck, you can just come back to this video and see how I wrote my code. If you do this route, um, your code might look different than mine, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong or bad about your code. There are some best practices when it comes to coding, and there is some code that is cleaner and more efficient than other pieces of code, but there's also just different code writing styles. So just because your code looks different than mine doesn't necessarily mean one piece of code is better than the other. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at this challenge. Let's just exit out of here. Now let's go down to this brief section. Now here we can see our challenge is to build this order summary card and get it as close to looking like the design as possible. This says our users should be able to see interactive states. Interactive states are, for example, when you hover your mouse over a button, the button might light up or the button might change color. We can also see here that we have this amazing Slack community. If you get stuck at any point in this tutorial, you can join this free Slack group and get help. If you get stuck, you can also look at my completed solution, or you can look at all of the other solutions for this challenge that have been posted here on Frontend Mentor. Okay, let's scroll back up and we'll hit Visit Challenge Hub. Now, mine says I've already started the challenge. Uh, if you haven't started the challenge yet, then you might see a slightly different screen, but this view should look pretty similar for you here. Okay, so next we wanna hit Download Starter Files. Next, we see this step two, which says download design files. 
We are using a free membership, so we don't have access to the design file. But let me explain what this is if you don't know. When you start working as a developer, you will often be given designs from your designer at your company, and these will essentially be pictures of how the application you are building is supposed to look. Figma and Sketch are really commonly used tools that you can use to see the designs of the application that your designer gave you. As a quick example, we can go to this Figma UI design tutorial on FreeCodeCamp. Next, we can scroll down and we can see what the Figma app looks like. Okay, so say you're working as a software developer and the designer at your company, they gave you this design and they said, this is what this part of the app looks like. You as the developer would go open up your Figma app and you can click on things such as this new arrival text. And when you click on it, you'll be able to see the exact font color used. You'll also be able to see other things that will help you build the app and help you make the app look as close to design as possible. If we go back to our order summary component challenge, we don't have our design files in Figma because we're using a free account, but that's actually okay because we are essentially going to eyeball it. We're going to look at the pictures that were given in this download starter files kit, and we're gonna kind of guess what colors we'll use, and this is gonna work out really well for us. I wanted to explain what Figma was real quick in case you weren't familiar with design tools like Figma or Sketch. And I also wanted to explain it because when I was learning how to code, I didn't know about tools like Figma and Sketch. And I always wondered, like, how exactly does a developer turn a design into code? Okay, so let's get to building. We already hit download starter files, so let's open these starter files in our text editor. The next thing I've done is I've opened up my downloads folder and I found the starter files folder. This says main three because I've already downloaded this a few times. So yours might just say order summary component main. Let's actually grab this and we're going to drag it down into our VS code down here. When we dragged our download starter kit folder into our text editor, it opened up our text editor as we can see here. Okay, so it might feel like a lot just happened. Let's pause for a second. If you're not familiar with a text editor yet, a text editor is where you'll write your code. If you think about writing, maybe when you go write a blog post, you use Notion, or maybe you use Google Documents to write an essay for class. In Google Docs, you write words. When you're writing code, developers use something called text editors. I use VS Code, which is pretty popular, but you can use any text editor that you'd like. If you're looking right now at my text editor, you might see a bunch of things and you just have no idea what they are, uh, and that is totally okay. There are a lot of features inside of a text editor, and you don't need to know all of them or even most of them right now. Let's expand this. I'm going to make my screen a bit bigger. Okay, now we're in our starter files. Let's briefly go over what our starter files include. First, we see this design folder. And here we simply have different pictures of what our app or our component will look like. And again, if you work as a developer, you will usually be given designs by your designer in a tool like Figma or Sketch. But for today, we will be looking at these pictures to reference as we build our app. As a side note, throughout the course, I'm going to call what we're building either an app or a component. And sometimes I might just call this a card because it kind of looks like a card. Just wanted to note that in case you get confused later on when I'm saying card or app or component. I'm really just referring to this project that we're building. Okay, so we see that we have our order summary component, and then we also see this thing called active states. Now this is the view or the design of what our card will look like when we're in an active state. In other words, when you hover over the card with your mouse. You might have this experience when you're on websites and there is some 
interactivity. You go and you're about to click a button, you're hovering over the button, and maybe the button looks like it bounces or it changes color or something like that. Now, these are considered to be active states. We also have mobile and desktop designs, and these designs tell us like what the card should look like when you're on your phone versus when you're on your computer. For our purposes today, we're just going to focus on building the desktop view. If you like as an extra challenge when you're finished with this course, you can work on building the mobile view. That's when you'll learn about things called media queries. Okay, so moving on, we also have this folder of images, and this is just going to be all the images that we use in our app. Earlier I noted that web files are HTML files, but they can also be other files such as images. So we'll be putting these into our app. Now this is a bit beyond the scope of the course, but the next file we have is this git ignore. This is if you're using git and github to commit your code and then put it on github. If you're going to commit your code and put it on github, then this file just says what files should github ignore. That is, if you committed this whole folder to GitHub right now, then anything specified in this file would not get committed, or in other words, it would not get included. Next, let's go to this index.html file right here. In this index.html file, we have a HTML setup as well as the information we need to build our car or our app. And we actually could start coding in this file but we're going to create a new folder to build our app. We're going to create a new folder to build our app because I want us to build this app completely from scratch. Next up, we have a few readme's. Now, these are all really just telling us about the project and how you can complete this challenge. Lastly, we have our style guide, and this is going to show us the font colors and the font family that we need for our application. This is going to help us style our project so that it looks as close to the designs as possible. Okay, so like I said, we're going to be building our project completely from scratch. So we're going to leave this folder here and we'll reference it later. Next up, we're going to open up our terminal and start building our project. Okay, next I'll come over to my desktop. And as a side note, I am on a MacBook Pro. The next thing I'm going to do is come down here and click on my terminal. So I'm going to click iTerm. Okay, so this is opened and then I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. If you don't know what a terminal is yet, a terminal is just a tool you can use to work with your computer. You can type commands into your terminal. Terminals can seem really scary at first, but they're not too bad once you learn a bit more about them. Okay, next we're going to create a new repository for our order summary component. A repository is just a place where all the code for this project will be stored. Repository is also just another name for a folder, really. If you want to, you can put your repository on GitHub. GitHub is a place where developers can share their code so other developers or really whoever can see it and read it. Again, we won't go over GitHub in this course, but I would definitely recommend that you put the code from this course onto GitHub, and then you have that GitHub link in your developer portfolio. That way, as a developer, when you are showing off your developer portfolio, others will be able to see the code that you wrote. Okay, so next up, we're gonna use the command mkdir, and this will create a new repository or a new folder, and we're going to name it order summary component. This creates this new repository with this name. The next thing we want to do is we want to open up this order summary component repo that we just created, and we want to open up this project inside of our text editor. So this project is just an empty folder so far, and we want to put files inside of that folder so we can add code to those files. In other words, we want to build our website. So let's open up this order summary folder inside of our text editor. We can do this by saying code order summary component. And next we'll hit enter. And as you can see, this opens our order summary component folder inside of our text editor. If you run this command that I just ran and it's not working for you, 
then you can Google Open VS Code from Terminal on Mac, and there should be instructions on how to set that up. If you're using a different computer or a different terminal or that's just not working, you can also manually open VS Code. So you can go down here and click open, and then you can go to file open, and you can go find the repository that you just created. Okay, next up, let's expand this. Okay, I just took a quick break and now I'm back and we're ready to start creating our files. So here I'll right click and I'll hit new file and I'll write out index.html and I'll hit enter. This is where we'll be writing our HTML. Earlier, if you remember, we talked about how websites are made up of web files such as HTML files, JavaScript files, and CSS files. What we've done here is we've created our first HTML file, which is really exciting. I think in this moment, you might feel like we're doing something really basic and you want to get to the advanced stuff. But right now we're really learning the fundamentals and you will use these fundamentals throughout your career as a developer. You might be wondering like, why did we name this file index.html? Index.html is a special name that we can use and it will tell our browser that this is the home page of our app. The index.html page is the default page on a website if no other page is specified. This index.html file will be the file we'll view in our browser. We're going to hit this button, uh, which will close that tab there so we have more space on our screen. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to write out an exclamation point and then we're going to hit enter. I'm also going to hit Command Plus, which on my MacBook will make the code a little bit bigger. When we hit that exclamation point, we just created some boilerplate code using Emmet. Emmet is a tool that's built right into VS Code. If you are using a different text editor, you can just look at our finished code for the project that's linked below, and you can grab this HTML boilerplate. Or you can pause the video and write out what you see here on the screen. Just make sure there aren't any typos, otherwise uh, some part of your app might not work. Okay, so we have this HTML boilerplate, but what is this code and what is it doing? When developers say boilerplate code, they mean pieces of code that are included in lots of places without any alteration. In other words, code that won't change and could be used for many projects. This HTML boilerplate is just some code that provides a foundation for any website we built. Let's look at a bit more of this code. Here we have this title tag. This is an HTML code tag that allows you to give your web page a title. So we can switch this and we can say our title is order summary component. And we can hit save. If you notice that when I hit save, my code jumped around a little bit. And that is because I have uh, an auto formatter on. So every time I save, my code gets formatted. Right now, you probably don't have any auto formatting on, uh, but at some point you might be using it. So now we've added this title to our site. Instead of document, it now has the title of order summary component. And instead of having to write out the title tag ourselves, we just use that exclamation point that automatically added the title tag as well as these other tags that we need. We can also see that we have this HTML tag right here. Or in other words, we see these words HTML and then we have these odd brackets side by side. So this is an HTML tag. This tag just tells the browser that everything inside of this tag is HTML. We also see we have this meta tag. So UTF-8 is a kind of Unicode. We need to use encoding so we can translate the letters we use into bytes that computers use. This might be a little bit confusing and you certainly won't need to know any more about bytes in this course. The next thing you'll see here is another meta tag with this viewport value here. This might look super confusing at first, but essentially we need this for a responsive site. A responsive site means a site that can work on all devices like your iPhone or your tablet or your computer. We want our app to look good on all of our different devices. Next we see we have this body tag here. The body tag defines the document's body. The body element contains all of the contents of an HTML document, such as headings, paragraphs, images, hyperlinks, um, tables, lists, and so on. 
So in other words, inside of our body tag, all of our HTML will live here. This is where it all goes. Let's actually write out some HTML. We want to create our order summary component, but first, let's just write a hello world. We're going to use a bold tag and we're going to say hello world and we're going to hit save. Again, you'll see my auto formatter, which is just pushing this tag over here, uh, kind of indenting the code and making it look nice. Okay, so we'll talk more about what exactly this is doing in a moment, um, but we want to next go and look at our app in our browser. As a refresher, we've created our HTML file uh, inside of our order summary component repo. We've added our boilerplate code, this basic HTML setup here. Uh, and then we've added this V tag with the words hello world. Now we want to load this in our browser. As briefly mentioned earlier, websites are usually made up of web files. Web files are usually HTML files, CSS files, and JavaScript files. Let's go to our browser, Chrome, and let's open up this file. Okay, so I've opened up my browser and I hit Command O, which opened this here. And now I can see that my repository is already open here. You might need to search inside of here to find your repo, or in other words, find your order summary component folder that we created. Next, I'm going to click on index.html and hit open. And now we've opened this up and we can see our hello world. I'm going to hit command plus and make this much bigger. So I'm just zooming into the screen here. So here we can see that we've opened this file up in our browser. Uh, we can see our app, but this is just local to our own computer, right? Uh, this is not some URL that is live on the internet. Uh, you won't be able to send this to your friends as a link or anything like that. In other words, we are just viewing this index.html file locally on your computer, uh, but it has not been deployed to the internet. We could deploy our application to the internet, uh, and that means we could go buy a domain like ordersummary.com, and we could deploy our app so that anyone who visited ordersummary.com they could go to that link and see our app. But for now, we just have this locally on our own computer. We just wrote this HTML that says, hello world, and I mentioned this thing called a B tag. Let's remove this B tag for just a moment. So over here, we're going to move this away and hit save. Now back in our browser, we can see that this text, hello world, still looks exactly the same. But if we go back to our app, we can see that the B tag is gone. The B tag is supposed to apply bold to these words. Uh, and so we remove the B tag, but we notice if we go back to our browser, go back to our app, B tag looks like it's still there. It looks like it's still getting applied. And this is because we have not yet hit refresh on our app. So we can hit command R or we can hit this button right here which will refresh our app. So we need to refresh our browser so that it can see the new changes that were made. Every time we write new code or tweak our code over in our text editor, we need to save that code and then come back to the browser and hit refresh if we want to see new changes that show up. So if I hit Command R, now we can see that the bold tag is gone. It seems silly to be hitting refresh every time you make a little change in your code. And it is kind of cumbersome and slow to hit refresh every time. Many developers use tools that make an automatic refresh happen so that you don't have to manually refresh your page to see your new code changes. However, since we are basically just getting started and we don't have any fancy tools yet, we're just going to be manually refreshing our page. Uh, but if this drives you crazy, uh, don't worry. It drives a lot of developers crazy. And there's a lot of tools these days so that you don't have to manually refresh every time you write code that is different or new. As I said, once we have refreshed, we can see that the bold we had before is gone. Now we just have this plain text that says, hello world. This text does look big, but again, that's only because I've zoomed in my screen a little bit. If you zoom your screen back out, this text will be pretty small. Here we just have this regular old text of hello world. It's just some content here on the screen. But when we added the bold tag, we told our browser to display this text in bold. We can start to see a little bit of why HTML is useful to us as developers. 
Back in our app, let's add a h1 tag and we'll write our hello world inside of there and we'll hit save. This h1 is an HTML heading tag. HTML heading tags are used to format headings on your page in order of importance. An h1 tag is much like the title on a cover of a book or the title on the front of a newspaper. Heading tags also have their own style. So let's go back to our browser and see this style. Back in our browser, if we hit refresh, we can see our text got much bigger and more bold. And this is the default style that's applied to h1 tags. I've been talking a lot about HTML and these things called tags. Let's go over these HTML basics a bit more. HTML is short for Hypertext Markup Language. Uh, no one really remembers what this stands for, and it's really not that important. What is important to know is that HTML isn't actually a programming language. HTML is absolutely a valid language that programmers use. However, it is not a programming language. It is actually a markup language. What's the difference then between a markup language and a programming language? Programming languages like JavaScript use logic to control things on the page. For example, let's think about our buttons that are in the order summary component design. Because we aren't using a programming language today, nothing will happen when we click on our button in the app that we're creating. However, if we had added JavaScript to this project, we could say, okay, if we click on the button, let's make something happen. Let's add logic to control what happens here. Maybe we'll move to a new view, or maybe when we click the button, a piece of text will pop up that says, okay, all done. But because this project is only HTML and CSS, our buttons in this application won't have any interactivity to them. In other words, they won't do anything. You might be wondering, well, if programming languages like JavaScript use logic to control things on web pages, then what does a markup language like HTML actually do? HTML is the code that is used to structure a web page and its content. HTML consists of a series of elements which you use to wrap different parts of the content on your web page. We saw this a moment ago when we created our Hello World. Websites can have only HTML on them and nothing else. You can build a site with just HTML and CSS. However, it will probably be a boring and ugly website uh, because it won't have any interactivity uh, using JavaScript and the site will also not look very pretty because it wouldn't have any CSS. And we'll go more into CSS in just a bit. For now, let's get a bit more into HTML syntax. So first we'll learn kind of the concepts and ideas of HTML, and then we'll go use them as we're writing out our application. Let's go into HTML syntax more. First we'll go over the syntax and then we'll take that syntax and we'll use what we learned to build our application. When I say syntax, what do I mean? Uh, the word syntax can seem kind of scary when you first hear it, but syntax refers to uh, the rules that define the structure of a language. When you know the syntax of a language, you can use that language. First up, let's talk about HTML elements. Here, this entire thing is an HTML element. An HTML element is a basic unit of HTML. Everything here from the hello world to the weird brackets you see to both of the H1s on either side of the content, this is all part of the HTML element we see here. Now here, when you see this odd looking like greater than and less than, uh, this is the HTML tag itself. This is the opening tag and this other one over here is the closing tag. Tags are a special kind of text that you use to mark up your content on your web pages. These tags will tell your browser to display whatever is inside of the tag in a certain way. For every single HTML element, there is an opening tag and a closing tag. If you go back to our app and we go outside of the closing tag and we just write hello here and we hit save, then we refresh and we see that these styles that the H1 are given here, bigger and more bold, are not applied to this hello. And that's because this hello here is outside of the closing tag of the H1 here. 
Let's talk a bit more about HTML tags. So here we have the opening tag first. This opening tag states where the element begins or starts to take effect. And then next we have the closing tag over here. This is the same as the opening tag, except it includes this forward slash before the element name. The closing tag tells us where our element ends. In this case, this closing tag tells us where our h1 element ends. Again, this whole thing here is one HTML element. Our HTML element is made up of these tags, and it's also made up of the content. The content is whatever is between the opening tag and the closing tag. In this case, hello world is our content. And again, this whole thing with the content and both the opening tag and the closing tag, this is all one HTML element itself. We'll learn more about HTML as the course goes on, but let's go on to the second topic that we'll be covering in this course, which is CSS. We're going to right click again and hit new file and we'll say styles.css. Before we start writing out our CSS, let's dive into some CSS basics. What is CSS anyways? CSS stands for cascading style sheets. It's a styling language that modifies the appearance of the content of web pages. CSS by itself can't do very much. The purpose of CSS is to style markup language. In other words, the purpose of CSS is to style HTML elements and make them look great. We can actually inject a bit of CSS right into whatever HTML tag we want to style. Let's go do this. Next, we're going to add a style sheet, which will be our way of adding CSS to our HTML and connecting the files. So our app knows that it'll use this CSS that we're about to write. So we'll say link rel style sheet. Rel is short for relationship. And then we'll say styles, oops, styles.css. Uh, you see, I have an extra quote here. Uh, just making typos all the time. I'm going to remove that and hit save. Now we've connected our CSS to this index.html file, and we want to go to our browser and test that this actually worked. So let's remove this. So here, uh, in our opening tag and in between these two brackets, we can say style, uh, quotes, background, color. I'm using autocomplete there. Uh, your text editor might have an autocomplete. And then we're going to say, let's do aqua. And then we're going to hit save. If we go back to our browser and hit refresh, we see that this now has the background color of aqua. Next up, what if we want to add another h1 tag that says the hello world again? Let's do that. So we'll write h1. And here you might notice again that if I just wrote out the first h1, uh, suddenly this second closing tag just appears. Again, that is an extension I have that makes it a little easier and faster for me to write HTML. So inside of here, we'll say hello world again and we'll hit save. What if we want this second hello world again, uh, the second HTML element here to have the background color of aqua? Well, what we have to do is add this same style attribute again. So I'm being lazy and I'm being a true developer and I'm going to hit command C. Uh, in other words, I copy this and then I'm going to paste this here and hit save. Now we've accomplished our goal of having both of these H1 tags have the background color of aqua. If we go back to our app and refresh, we can see that we have both of our HTML elements and they both have the correct background that we want them to have. Now, this is okay, but it's going to get tedious uh, if we need to add this so many times. Imagine if we have dozens of HTML tags on our real website, and we're going to have to add this in several different places all over. There is an easier way to do this. Instead, we're going to use CSS selectors. We'll be using CSS selectors all throughout the rest of the course. A core piece of CSS syntax is the selector. A CSS selector is the first part of a CSS rule. It is a pattern to tell the browser which HTML elements should be selected to have the CSS property values inside the rule applied to them. 
A CSS selector, like this part on its own, is the first part of a CSS rule. So this entire thing is one CSS rule. A selector is a pattern of elements that tells the browser which HTML elements should be selected to have the CSS property values inside the rule applied to them. Next, we have these curly brackets that you see here. These curly brackets are used to signify the start and the end of the styles that will be applied to this selector. Everything in between these curly brackets are styles that are applied to the HTML elements that match this selector. Inside of these brackets are property value pairs. Each property has a value. Let's go over an example. So here, where is the selector? The selector is this H1 element. Here we are essentially saying, okay, go select all the H1 elements and make them all have a background color of aqua. Back in our app, we had to write this code twice here. And as developers, we really don't want to be writing the same code over and over again if we can help it. So instead, we'll use our selector to grab all H1 tags and set their background color to aqua. Let's go back to our app and we'll remove this style attribute here. So we remove it and we remove this and we hit save. Now let's go into our styles.css and we'll say exactly what we saw on the screen a second ago. We'll say h1, uh, we'll do the curly brackets. So this is our selector. Uh, and then inside of our brackets, these are the CSS styles that we want applied. We'll use the property of background color and we'll use the value of aqua and we'll hit save. If we go back to our app and refresh, we see no difference, which is exactly what we want. The background color of both of these H1 elements is now aqua, and we didn't have to write the same code twice. Okay, so we've learned some HTML and CSS basics, and we're ready to jump into building the rest of our project. We will learn more HTML and CSS on the way as we go. One quick thing to note before we keep going. Let's briefly talk about how JavaScript works with HTML and CSS. I mentioned JavaScript earlier, and JavaScript is beyond the scope of this course. It's something that we won't be covering, but I want you to understand how JavaScript works with HTML and CSS so you can kind of understand how they holistically work together. As a front-end developer, you're going to use HTML and CSS to build and style the content of your website. You would also use JavaScript alongside the HTML and CSS. So these three languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you will use them all the time as a front-end developer. What's always helped me is to think of a house analogy. Think of your application like it's a house. So the HTML is the building blocks of your house. Uh, the CSS is the styles of that house. And JavaScript is the interactivity of the house. JavaScript is the moving parts of the house. Back in our app again, we have two different H1 elements here, and we've created this rule which says for every H1 element, give it the background color of aqua. Now, if we go back over here, what if we do not want this second H1 tag to have a background color of aqua? What if we just want this to have a regular color of black, for example? The problem is we already wrote this CSS rule that says we want all H1s to have this background color of aqua. Every single H1 tag that we create on this page will get a background color of aqua, and we no longer want that. So instead, we're going to use another CSS selector that solves this problem. We want to say, okay, I want this H1 tag in particular to have a background color of aqua, but I do not want this H1 tag to have that color. We somehow need to differentiate these two HTML elements. We need to somehow get this element specifically, uh, target this element specifically, and make sure it has a background color of aqua, but not this one. And to do this, we're going to use a class selector. The class selector selects elements with a specific class attribute. 
Back in our app, inside of our H1 opening tag, we're going to create a space and we're going to say class. And then inside of our quotes, we're going to say aqua element. And we're going to hit save. I'm also going to just copy this. Next, we're going to go back to our CSS. And instead of this H1, we're going to paste in that class name and we're going to add a little dot right there and hit save. Now we are using a class selector. In here, we gave our H1 tag a class with the name of aqua element. And then we created this CSS rule for this specific class. If we save this and go back to our application and hit refresh, we see that we did exactly what we wanted. This second H1 element no longer has the background color of aqua. This is the power of class selectors. And again, we'll use a bunch of different selectors as the course goes on. Let's start building the very first part of our application. Let's go back over here and we'll remove this CSS rule. And then back over here, we're going to get rid of our hello world. Next up, we are going to write out our first div. So we're going to say div, and then we're going to write out for now, we'll just write card and we'll hit save. You might be wondering, like, what is a div? What is this? The div tag defines a division or a section in an HTML document. The div tag is used as a container for HTML elements. This div is going to be the container for our order summary card. We'll give this a class of card. So we'll say class card and we'll hit save. Actually, we're going to make this lowercase. You might be wondering, why did I call this card? Well, in my eyes, this whole order summary component seems like a card on a page conceptually. If we go back to the design in frontendmentor.io, we can see that this is the whole page. And then within the page is our component. And we could also call it a card. It kind of looks like a card on a page here. So the card kind of symbolizes the whole order summary component on the page. The div that we just created with the class of card this div will be the entire component that we see here. Everything inside of this div will be the image, the text, and all of the buttons. In other words, everything inside of this div with the class of card will be everything inside of our order summary component. Okay, let's save this. And then if we go back and refresh, we can see that so far we just have this div with the class of card and it just says card so far. Back in our starter files, I'm looking at the design of the card or the design of the component. The first thing I'm going to do is give this card a width. So we can see we have this whole page and there's a certain width of this card. So back in our styles, we are going to use the class selectors and say dot card width. This is the property and then the value is going to be 450 pixels and we'll hit save. Next up, we need to give this card the background color that it needs. It just needs a white background, so we can say background color white and hit save again. Now, so far, it doesn't look like much has changed. We just have this text of card. But again, if we go to inspect and we look at our developer tools, uh, we can see that this card now has a width of 450 pixels and a background color of white. You might be able to notice the width more if we change this. So we can change this to orange, for example. And here we can see that our card only has the width of 450 pixels and not anything more. The next thing we're going to do is grab our CSS variables. First of all, let's go back to our starter files and let's go back down to the style guide. Now that we've opened our style guide, we are going to take all of these and just hit command C. So we're going to copy these. If you've never seen this HSL before, this is just one format for a certain color. You might have seen a hex code in other CSS examples, and these are just different ways of representing a certain color in code. Back in our application and back in styles.css, we are going to push this down and we're going to write out roots and then brackets, and we're going to paste in our colors here and we'll get rid of this code comment. If you're wondering what root means, uh, this root is a place where we can declare global CSS variables. Uh, so variables, in other words, that we can use within all of our CSS. Now, we want to turn these into CSS variables. 
To create a CSS variable, we need to write two dashes and then the name. So we're going to say dash, uh, put this into lowercase, and then create a dash here. So this will be the name together. And then we're going to do this for all of the other ones. Awesome. And then we're going to hit save. We also need to make sure that we remember our semicolons on each of these. Okay, so we can see we have a typo where we need another dash here. Next up, let's test that these variables work and then we'll see why they're useful. So our card just needs a white background, but for now, let's use a CSS variable. So we'll write out var and then inside of here, we need to add the CSS variable that we want. So we'll say var dark blue and we have this nice autocomplete here. So I'll just hit this, add the semicolon and hit save. And if we go back over here and we refresh, we see we have this background color with the dark blue that we want. We don't actually want this background color. This isn't the color of our car, but we just wanted to demonstrate that this CSS variable works. Let's remove that and hit save. We'll also switch this back to just plain white and hit save again. You might notice that this white right here, we didn't actually create the CSS variable up here. Uh, it just comes with CSS by default. So it's kind of like a CSS uh, defaults variable. Whereas the specific colors that we need in our app, we assign those to CSS variables that we created and we gave them custom names. So these names could really be anything. Next up, let's give our page on the application a background color. If we go back to our starter files, we can see we have this beautiful like purplish or blue background here. And we see this kind of squiggly wave right here. Now, this is actually a mix of two things on the page. It is a background image and it is also a color. Back in our app, we want to take this body tag and give it not only a background image, but also a color. The body tag is really the rest of the page and our card or our component is sitting inside of that body tag. The body element contains all the contents of an HTML document, such as headings, paragraphs, hyperlinks, tables, lists, and so on. There can only be one body tag in an HTML element. We are going to give this body tag, first of all, a background image. Let's first add the image that we need. If we go back to our designs, like I said, we're actually using an image here to create this kind of wave effect. It's a little bit hard to tell, but that's what we're doing. So let's go ahead and grab this image. We'll hit this button and we'll go down here and we'll copy this pattern background desktop. So we'll hit copy. Next up, we're going to create a, another folder inside of our order component summary folder. So we'll say new folder and we'll write out images. And in here is where all of our images will belong. We can create folders inside of our main repo or inside of our main order summary component folder to keep our files really organized. After clicking this images folder, we're going to hit command V. Next, we'll close this again. And then back in our styles.css, we're going to write out body. So our selector is the body tag in this case. And then our styles or our property values are going to be in here. And we're going to write background image. And then we're going to say URL images and we have this nice autocomplete and we're going to grab the pattern image that we want and we're going to hit save. We also want to remove this and make this white again and we're going to again hit save. Back in our app, we hit refresh and we also closed our dev tools and this looks okay so far, but we have to remember that we're actually extremely zoomed in here. Sometimes I forget about this. So I am actually zoomed in because as you're watching this, I want you to be able to see the code on my screen really well, but zooming in can also sometimes make your app look funky. So let's go back to a hundred percent. I'm going to hit command minus right now. We're at 300% and we're going to go back down to a hundred percent. Now we're back at a hundred percent of the correct kind of zoom size. And we can see the problem is that we have this wave effect, but 
it keeps repeating on the screen. Like it's much too small for the screen, it seems like. And so it's just repeating once, twice, and then three times down here. Let's fix this. We can say background repeat, no repeat, and we'll hit save. We don't want our background here to be repeating. If we refresh, now we see this is exactly what we want. Our background is not repeating and filling the space. The next problem is that we do want this background image to be a little bit bigger. So back in our app, we we'll use the background size CSS property for this. The background size CSS property sets the size of the element's background image. For this particular use case, we want the value of cover. So we'll say background size cover, and we'll hit save. If we go back to our app and refresh, this is looking fantastic. It's very similar to our design. Back to our design, we can see that we've already done this wave effect, and then the rest of the page has this slightly different kind of purple page, looks like the pale blue CSS variable that we created earlier, so we'll use that. Back in our application, I'm just going to copy this because, again, I'm too lazy to write it out, and then we're going to say background color, and then we're going to say var and then paste in our CSS variable of pale blue. We'll add our semicolon and we'll hit save or command S. If we refresh our app again, we can now see this is looking fantastic. This is exactly what we want. Going on and looking at our design, figuring out like what should we build next, uh, we can see that most of our text inside of our order summary component, or in other words, inside of our card, is this kind of light color. So let's go add that color to the div that has the card class. So in here, we'll say color var, and it is desaturated blue. And we'll hit save. If we go back to our application, uh, we're going to zoom back in. So we're going to hit command plus a few times just to make this a bit bigger. Uh, we'll hit refresh, and we see this has changed to the color that we want. We can also see this change if we open up our dev inspector tool. So we can hit inspect and we can use this and select our div with the class of card. And we can see that it has this color. If we toggle this, it will go away and toggle it back. The color will be applied again. We use the color property because the color property specifies the color of the text. So if we wanted, we could change this to anything. We could say pink and it would show up here. And of course, if we refresh this page again, that pink is gone. Uh, if we refresh the page, the original styles that we coded up in our styles.css are back and the pink will be gone. So when we fiddle with these colors down here and we change these in the browser, this isn't actually changing anything in our code base itself. It's just momentarily showing us like what these changes would look like in the browser. So we can tweak things here, but it's not going to affect any of our actual code in our app. This dev inspector can work amazing if you are debugging because you can see which styles actually got applied or not. For example, back in our app, let's say we take away one of these dashes, right? So maybe we just forgot the dash. Uh, we made a typo. This happens all the time. And then if we go back to our app and we refresh again uh, and we look down here, we can see that this color is no longer getting applied. So our developer tools will actually give us this little warning sign right here. So you might come into the app and you see, okay, the color is not there, I wonder why. And you can inspect this and look down here and see this warning. And this says invalid property value. This is kind of like an awesome clue that CSS is giving you. It's telling you that there's something wrong with the code. We can go back here and add this dash again and then know that it's working. Let's stop for a second and notice something really interesting. So back over here in our index.html, we have this word card. Let's add another div nested inside of it. And inside of this div, we'll have the content of I love coding and we'll hit save. Let's go back to our browser and we'll refresh. Next, let's inspect this second div. And one thing we notice about this div here is that even though this div does not have the class of card, it actually has the soft blue color, right? Its text is this soft blue. Why is this? This div does not have a class that is telling it to have this color of soft blue, and yet it is still this soft blue color. 
We can find the answer by scrolling down a bit and we see that we are hovering over this div, right? And then we see these words inherited from div.carp. What happened here was that this child div, I love coding, it actually inherited its color from its parent div that has a class of carp. And our dev tools are actually telling us that right here. So we are basically saying, okay, any children inside of the div with the class of cart will also have the text color of soft blue. Think about this card div as being the parent div. This div with the content of I love coding, this div is inside of the parent div. In other words, uh, the parent div has this opening tag and the closing tag, and this div is between the opening and the closing tag. And so this is the child of this parent div. And here we're really saying, okay, uh, any children inside of this div with the class of card are going to have the text color of blue. Think about this card as being the parent div and the card inside of it is the baby. And the baby inherited the way that it looks from its parents. This inheritance is a fundamental piece of CSS. CSS cascades. Uh, in other words, this means that styles cascade down or are inherited from parent to child. This can be really tricky because sometimes you have a div and you don't know where it's getting its style or something on your page looks really funky and you're like, wait, I didn't make that div that size. Uh, and so it's inheriting some sort of style from somewhere else. The next question you might ask is, what if I don't want my child div to inherit its color from the parent div? Okay, so if we want to rebel, we can use the class selector here. So we can say class, and we'll just call this child for now, and we'll hit save. And then back in our styles, we can say dot child, and we can add another color property here. So we can say color, and we'll say red, and we'll hit save. If we go back to our app and refresh, we can see that this child div now has the color of red. So this child div has this color of red and it's now overriding its inherited color. If we scroll down a little bit, we can see that this is now slashed out because we have a more specific color property with a value set here. And so this inherited style will no longer uh, be applied here. This can be a bit confusing because if you go back to our app and you say, okay, we have this card div with this color of desaturated blue, and then we have this div inside of the parent div with the color of red, you might sometimes wonder like, okay, which one wins here, right? Like which CSS rule actually gets applied? Is it the blue one or is it the red one? And CSS answers this by saying the most specific rule wins. And in this case, the most specific rule is the child div with the color of red, because this rule is more specific to this div. This is called CSS specificity. I can never say CSS specificity right, so I'm going to try to say it as infrequently as I possibly can. But CSS specificity is uh, the means by which the browsers decide which CSS property values are the most relevant to an element and therefore will be applied. Now this can seem complex, so let's look at a great cheat sheet for this. Okay, so this is a really fun little site called CSS Specificity. I again cannot really say that without getting tongue tied. Uh, but here you can see when you are applying styles to your divs, like what styles will win? In other words, what styles will actually get applied in order of importance? Okay, so now that we've learned about CSS specificity, let's move on and let's work more on our order summary component. Let's keep building. We're going to remove this child div. We're not really going to need it now. And we're gonna go over here and remove it here. Back in our designs, let's create our title next. This is our order summary title. Now, back inside of our card div, we're going to actually remove this word card. This was just kind of placeholder text. We don't need it anymore. Next, we're going to add an H2 element, and we're going to say order summary, and we'll hit save. Next, we want to add styles to this H2 tag. If we go back over here and we refresh, we can see it doesn't really have much style on it yet. Let's use a class selector. 
So we'll give this a class name of title and we'll hit save. Back over here, we'll say dot title and then we'll add our styles within here. First we'll say color. So we want this order summary text to have a color of dark blue. So we'll say bar dark blue. Next up, we want to give this a font weight of 900. And if you're wondering, I got this font weight from inside of our starter files. Lastly, we also want this to have a font size of 32 pixels. And we'll hit save. Again, we're deciding how this style looks from looking at the image that we have in our starter files of the design. If we go back and hit refresh, we can see that this is looking a bit more similar to the design. I am going to make this a tiny bit smaller because it's a little bit bigger than is really necessary right now. That's better. The next thing that we want to do is add this cool image that we see here back in our starter files. So within our starter files, we're going to go and grab this image from the images folder that they provided for us. This is the illustration hero. So we're just going to copy this. Back in our application, we're going to go to our images folder and we're going to hit paste. Awesome, so now we have this here. Now, when you see all of this, uh, you might be thinking, okay, this doesn't look like an image here. Uh, this is an SVG, which is just a different kind of an image file. So it's kind of like a JPEG, but there are differences that we won't go into in this course. So now we can just close this and we're actually going to close this as well. And then lastly, we'll close this. So we have more space and go back to our index.html file. Next up, right above our h2 tag, we are going to use an image tag, and this will allow us to display our image. So we're going to say image src, and then here we need to write out the file path to our image. So we'll say images and then find it here. Uh, again, we can use our awesome autocomplete and say illustration hero.svg. And then we can use a closing tag and hit save. One last thing we can do is add an alt tag. So we can say alt hero image and hit save. An alt tag, also known as an alt attribute or an alt description, is an HTML attribute applied to image tags to provide a text alternative. Next, we can go back and refresh and we can see that our image is here and it's looking awesome. The great thing about this image is that it's fitting perfectly. If we inspect this image, it has a width of 450 pixels, which is exactly the width of our car. But this width is actually not being inherited from the car. So where are we getting this width from? Like why does this image have a width of 450 pixels? If we go back to our app and we go look at this SVG, we see that there's actually a width hard-coded into this SVG. Now, this is fine, but imagine if we want to use this same image in other places in the application. For example, what if we want to use this image as the background of another page in our app? If we use this image as the background in another page in our app, then we would not want this image to have the width of 450. But because this file is giving this exact width of 450, that means that anywhere that we use the image as many times as we use it, it's always going to have this width of 450 pixels. This isn't great for when our app scales, right? So if we do want to at some point add another page in our app and use this image again, then we'll be stuck with this hard-coded width of 450 pixels, and we don't want that. Let's go ahead and actually remove this width. So we're going to remove this and hit save. Now, if we ever use this image again elsewhere, it's not going to have this hard-coded width of 450. If we go back to our app and we refresh, we can see that this image no longer has the width of 450. This seems like a problem at first, but we're going to actually fix this. Let's go back to our app and we're going to close this for now. We don't really need it anymore. And we're going to give this image a class and we'll call it hero image and we'll hit save. Next in our styles, we are going to go down here and use the class selector. So we'll say hero image and then we're going to use the property of width and we're going to say 100% and we'll hit save. Width 100% means that we want to make this image element have the width of its parent element. 
Whenever you see a width of 100% on a div, you'll know that that div is just going to be the width of its parent. Now if we go back to our app and hit refresh, we can see that our image tag now has the width of 450 because that is the width of its parent. We've added our order summary title and we've also added our image. Let's start adding some of the stuff down here. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is create a new div and we're going to give it the class of container. And inside of this div is everything inside of that white space that we saw, including this title. So here I'm going to hit option up arrow and move this guy so he's nested inside of this uh, container div right here. And then we're going to hit save. Let's go over to our styles.css and then down here we'll say container and let's give this some padding. We can say 30 pixels and we can always go tweak this if we want. Cool. So if we refresh, we can see we have a bunch of padding. We just added some padding right now and we talked a little bit about padding and margin earlier, but we haven't really gone into uh, like what exactly are padding and margin. So let's dive into that right now. To talk about margin and padding, we're going to talk about one of the most important concepts in CSS, which is the CSS box model. Okay, so the CSS box model. In CSS, you can think of every element as a box. So everything you see on a website, whether it's a footer or a menu bar, everything is a box. If there is a parent div and there are some children divs inside of it, uh, that parent div you can think of as a box with certain properties and all of the children divs inside of it or different tags inside of it, you can think of as a box as well. And once you kind of understand this, you'll understand how the HTML elements on your page are working better and you'll be able to write better CSS. Okay, so every box consists of four parts. You have the content. So the content is the content of the box. The content of the box is where things like text and images appear. Earlier, we had that one div that just said hello world. And so for that box, the content was just the text of hello world. Um, so you can have some text or a video or several images and all of that is the content in a box. And there can definitely be a ton of different content. Next, you have padding. So padding creates space inside of an element. You also have border. Every box can have a border and a border goes around the padding and the content. A border can have like a texture and a color and things like that. You also have margin. So margin creates extra space around an element. So during the pandemic, we had that like keep six feet apart rule. So if you think of yourself like as a box, um, you could say you have, you know, six feet of margin between you and other people. It's space between you and other elements. Padding and margin are easy to confuse, and I used to confuse them all the time. But margin is when you want to have space around the outside of your box. So you're pushing that box away from other boxes on the page. And padding is when you want to have more space inside of the box. So space between the content and the border. Okay, so this is called the CSS box model. And for every single element on your page, you can think about that element as a box with these four properties. This is more of a visual representation that you'll see in your dev tools. And we can see we have our content, padding, uh, border, and margin. Now, every HTML element can have all of these things, but it doesn't have to have them. So in other words, you could have uh, padding set at zero, margin set at zero, etc. Okay, so let's see this in action. And back in our app, we're going to add a paragraph tag and we're gonna put our text inside of it and hit save. Paragraph tags are used to define a block of text as a paragraph. Now we hit save, uh, we can refresh and then see our new text showing up here. And then we're gonna go back to our inspector. Okay, so we're gonna hit this and then we're going to click on our paragraph tag here. Now let's write a little bit in our CSS dev tools. And again, just to remind you, when we write in here uh, in our browser, these are just showing us some temporary styles, but of course this won't change any of our code uh, in our repo. Now let's say we want to also add some padding to this paragraph tag. So we can say padding, and earlier we had that 30 pixels. So we can say 30 pixels. And if we look and see what happened here, padding is in the green. And so when we said 30 pixels with just one value here, we gave padding to the top, 
the left, the right, and the bottom. So when there is just one value right here with this property of padding, that one value gets applied to every single side of the div, the top, the right, the left, the bottom. So what if we just wanted to give the top of this div some padding and nothing else? One thing we could do is we could say padding top. And then if we look again, we can see that there's that green right there only at the top of the div. So padding is zero on the left and the right and the bottom of the div. If we wanted to give padding to just the bottom of the div, we could say padding bottom like that. Okay, so say that you wanted to have different values on the top, the left, the right, and the bottom. So you could say padding bottom, uh, 30 pixels, uh, padding top, uh, 25 pixels, padding right, 10, uh, padding left, 5 pixels. No. Okay, so you probably will never do this because your padding right and your padding left should generally, but not always, uh, have the same values. But we can see here that we just wrote four separate lines of code. And instead, we can use something called CSS shorthands. Okay, so you might not always do this where you have your padding right and your padding left at different values. Uh, generally, you'd want them to be the same value, generally, but not always. But I want to illustrate a point here, which is what if you need different values for the bottom, the top, the right, and the left? So you won't be able to use that just, you know, padding where you put in one value, uh, and this goes everywhere, top, right, left, and bottom. So you'll have to use these, or you can use something else called CSS shorthand. So if I uncheck all of these, which means they won't get applied, and then, oh, this isn't getting applied because I have a typo here where I didn't put 40 pixels, you can see. So I'm going to take this right here, and then I'm going to write in four properties right here. Okay, so instead of writing padding bottom, top, right, and left, we can just write out padding with four values. You might be wondering, like, how do I know um, which value is applied where? So you can always think about a clock. So a clock goes from the top to the right, to the bottom, to the left. So this first value would be at the top. Then we head over to the right, just like a clock. Uh, then we head to the bottom, and then finally to the left. So this is a CSS shorthand property. Okay, so we've learned about padding. Uh, next, let's look at margin a bit. So again, margin is used to create extra space around the outside of an element. So we could say margin 50 pixels. And you can see this element now has more space around the outside of it. With margin, you can use all of the same shorthand properties that we used with padding. We also have the content, which we've already gone over. So the content in this paragraph tag or in this box is simply these words. And lastly, we have border. We could give this a border. We can say border um, one pixel solid orange. And there you can see a border showing up. If we go back to applying padding, we can understand padding a little bit better because by applying this padding, we are giving space around the inside of the element. So you can see that between the border and the content, there is more space. Okay, so I've just refreshed the page. One thing that you'll notice here is that there's actually a little bit of extra space right here. I don't know if you can see that just in the corner there. If we hover over our body tag, we can see that we have a margin of eight pixels. This is odd because you might be thinking, like, I never remember writing this. This is actually what is called a default style. So certain tags will come with default styles like we said. Let's go and remove this default style. Back in our app, we are actually going to make a little space here and we're going to say star and we're going to say margin zero. Oh, margin zero and padding of zero. And we're gonna hit save. Here we're using the all selector, so this star looking thing. This will select all the elements on the page and we're gonna give them a margin of zero and padding. We want to do this because we don't want to have any default margin or padding applied. If we refresh, we can see that the space we saw a second ago is now gone. The next thing we're gonna do is add box sizing border box. So we'll say box sizing border box. Okay, so what is border box and why are we applying it to every single element on our page? Border box tells the browser to account for any border and padding in the values you specify for an element's width and height. Okay, so first let's remove 
um, box sizing and we'll remove it so we can kind of see the problem that it solves when we add it back later. Okay, so here we have our card. It has a width of 450 pixels. And if we hover over here, we can see just below our card, just below the paragraph tag and the content, we can see that we have the width of 450 pixels. Let's say for whatever reason, we want to add some padding right. So we'll say padding right of 50 pixels. And here we can see our card now has a padding right of 50 pixels. Let's also notice what else changed. If we look over here, we can see that we now have a width of 500. Okay, so our card, even though down here, it says we have the width of 450 pixels, if we hover over our card div, we can clearly see that it now has the width of 500. And this is because the browser looked at the width of the card of 450 pixels, and then it looked at the padding, which is creating more space inside of the card. And it said, okay, so we have the width of 450 plus the padding right of 50 pixels. And so that equals a total width of 500 pixels. Here's the problem. We set this card to be a width of 450 pixels, but it's not actually that width anymore. And this is really confusing for a lot of developers because we want our card to have this width that we clearly defined, but then we're adding padding and it's going to increase our card width to 500. Now what we can do is add box sizing border box, and this is going to tell the browser that when determining the height or the width of this div, simply account for the padding. So we'll fit the padding into the total size of the box. In this case, we'll fit the padding into the total width. In other words, the browser will see this padding right of 50 pixels, and it will fit that padding into the original width of 450 pixels. Let's go back to our app and we'll uncomment this out and we'll hit save. Then we need to come back here and hit refresh. And then again, we'll give some padding right just here in the browser, hit save. And we can see that we have our padding, but we can also see that our width stayed at 450 pixels. So our padding was kind of shoved into this total width. I'd say most front end devs add box sizing border box to all of their elements just like this when they get started with a project because it's just more intuitive and it solves a lot of problems where our elements are much bigger than we expected them to be. Next up, back in our designs, we can see that this text has some space between it. But if we look in our app, this text has almost no space between it. So we'll use line height for this, which can be used to set the distance between text. Back in our app, we're going to give this paragraph tag a class. So we'll say class order description and we'll hit save. Then over in our styles, we're going to come down here and we'll say order description and we'll say line height and we'll try out 25 pixels and we'll hit save again. We come back and refresh, we can see that there's now some space between this text. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, if we want, we can really build any part of this app next. Uh, next up, I think I'll add the border. So if we look at our design again, we can see that this design has a nice rounded border. We'll go back to our card and we'll give this a border radius of 20 pixels. Back here, if we refresh, we can see we have this nice rounded border. Next up, let's grab the font that we're going to be using. So let's come back over here and let's look for our font. Okay, so here we see the font family. We're going to follow this link. Okay, so now we're going to add the font weights that we want. So we want 500, we want 700 and 900. Awesome. The next thing we're going to do is hit import and we're going to copy this link right here. Okay. So next up, we're going to add this import to the top of our app like so. Going to hit save. Then inside of our body tag down here, we're going to say font family, red hat display, sans serif. We go back to our app and we refresh. We can see that we now have the font that we want. Awesome. While we're here, we can also give our body a font size of 16 
and I saw that over in our starter files. If we refresh, we can see we have more of the size that we want. Keep in mind that I am again zoomed in here. So if we zoom back out, we'll start to see more of what our app actually looks like. But uh, I want you to be able to see this really well while you're taking this tutorial. So I'm going to zoom back in. One bug that we'll see here is that our borders got this really nice rounded border on the bottom, but up here, everything still looks like there's absolutely no border radius. To fix this issue, we'll use something else. We'll use the overflow CSS property. In this case, we're gonna use overflow hidden. So when the content of an element is too big and overflowing, we can hide that overflow. In our case here, this image is overflowing because this image is inside of the card div, but its square edges are overflowing. In other words, we have this card div that has rounded borders but the image is overflowing with its square borders. It's hiding the rounded border of the card. So let's add overflow hidden to our card div. And this is essentially saying, okay, when the content of the card div overflows, or in other words, when it's too big for the card, then we are going to hide that. Okay, so back here, we're going to say overflow hidden and we'll hit save. If we go back to our app and refresh, we can see that overflow hidden did its job perfectly. Okay, so next up, we want to add some margin to each element inside of this container. Let's go back to where we created our container styles. And we're going to say container, and then we're going to say margin 13 pixels, zero. Okay, so we're using this greater than star, which says all of the children inside of this container they will all get this margin with this value. When you have a margin property with two values, this means that the first value is for the top and bottom and the left and right are at zero. We just gave each element a top and bottom margin of 13 pixels and a left and right value of zero. Next up, let's build these buttons that we see here. Okay, so inside of our container div, and just below our paragraph tag, we're gonna add our first button. The button HTML element, it's an interactive element and it can be activated by a user and you can use it to add programmable actions, such as like opening a form or opening a new page. We won't go into that in this course, but those are some of the actions that you can use a button tag for. Since this course is all about HTML and CSS, our buttons won't have any interactivity, so nothing happens when we click on our buttons. Uh, they won't be very exciting, but we're going to make sure that they're styled correctly to look just like the design. Okay, so first off, I'll write out button, and then I'll give it a class. The first one we'll call the proceed button, and then inside I'll say proceed to payment, which is from the design, and I'll hit save. Next up, I'll essentially create an identical button, but this one will say cancel order, like how it says on the design, and we'll give it a class of cancel button. All right, if we go back to our app and refresh, we can see that these buttons look like total garbage. <laughs> these buttons also have a style already, which is kind of odd because we didn't add any styles to these, but like there's already a background color of gray and there's a border. And again, these are default styles from the browser. The browser has a basic style sheet that gives a default style uh, to certain elements. So we're gonna override these styles and make these buttons look how we want. Okay, so over in our styles, we are going to first focus on the proceed button. So we're gonna say proceed button, and we'll give it a background color of bright blue. And we're gonna hit save. Now let's go ahead and add everything we need for this button. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster. I'm gonna give this some padding, uh, a color or text color, in other words, of white, and I'm going to give it a box shadow. Let's give our button more of the styles that it needs. So we'll say width, 100%, uh, border, none. We wanna get rid of that default style border. Uh, font weight of 700, cursor, pointer, this means when you hover over the button, there will be a pointer. Uh, so it kind of indicates to the user that you're gonna click on something. 
Next, we're going to give it a font size of 0 0.9. We're going to give it a border radius, so it's a bit rounded. We'll go 12 pixels. If we go back and refresh, this button is looking so much better. You might have a few questions here, like for example, why did we add a width of 100%? We said width of 100% because if you remember, when you give an element a width of 100%, then it's going to take the width of its parent container. Next up, if we look at the designs, we can see that this button here is a certain color, and when you hover over this button, it changes color slightly. It almost looks like it's just a lighter or a more transparent version of the same color. For this, we're going to use the opacity property. So here we'll say proceed button hover, and we'll give it an opacity of 0 0.8 and we'll hit save. The opacity property specifies the opacity or the transparency of an element. So if we refresh, we can see once we hover over this button now, it has this opacity applied. Next, let's build the cancel button. Over here, we gave this button the class of cancel button. So we're going to copy this and come back to our styles and we'll say cancel button and we're going to start to add what we need. First, we'll give it this background color of white. We can see it had this white color in the design. Then we want to give it a text color. The text color was desaturated blue. Next, we want to get rid of its border that came in the default style, so we'll say border none. Then we want to give it a margin top of 22 pixels. Similarly to the proceed button, we'll give it a width of 100%. Next, we'll give it a font weight of 700. I got this from the designs again. Next, we'll give it a font size, 0 0.9. Next, we'll add a border radius of 12 pixels. And finally, we'll say cursor pointer. This button also has a hover state where the text color changes slightly. So for that, we'll say cancel button hover, and then we'll say color black. Let's go ahead and hit save, and then we'll look at our second button. If we go back over here and refresh, we can see that our button is looking much better, much more similar to the design, and it has this hover when we hover over cancel order. Back in our application, we can see that for both of these buttons, there are a lot of similar styles applied. For example, both of these buttons have the CSS property of width with the same value of 100%. Instead of repeating ourselves by writing a lot of the same styles twice, we're going to write them just once. So let's go up here and we'll say button. So this is selecting the button tag. Because there are only two buttons in this app, we can use this tag to select both of our buttons. So here we'll grab the styles that are used on both the proceed button and on the cancel button. So they both have a width of 100%. They both have border none, which is getting rid of that default style. They both have a font weight of 700. They both have a font size of 0 0.9. They also both have a border radius of 12 pixels and lastly, the cursor pointer. Great, so now in our proceed button and our cancel button, we can go and remove these styles. So we'll get rid of the width, border, basically just all of these, we can start getting rid of them. We can do the same over here for our cancel button. So you can say border none, get rid of this, basically all of these, and we can hit save. If we go back here, we can see that our buttons are still looking great. For this app, there are only two buttons here and both of them need these styles, but you should be careful using this button tag because this will select all of the buttons on the page and give it these styles. So if you had other buttons on this page, you might not want to use this button element here. Next up, if we go back to our app, we can see we have this purple box with a bunch of stuff in it. Let's get to building this by first adding the HTML. First up, back in our index.html, let's add a plan container that will hold everything that we see in the purple box. This will go right below our paragraph tag and above our buttons. So we'll create a div and we'll give it a class of plan container. And then next, let's add the image that we see. We go back to our starter files and we hit images. We need this icon music, so we're gonna copy this. Back in our app, we're going to paste this into our images folder like so. Back in our plan container div, we're going to say image src, 
and then we're going to say images icon music and we'll give it an alt of icon music and save. If we go back to our designs, we can see that we have this middle section here with annual plan and then it's telling us the price. We will wrap a container div around these two smaller divs so that we can line them up where one is stacked on top of another. So let's add these. Back in our plan container div, we're going to create a, another container div and we'll give it a class of plan description. Next up, we're going to add the annual plan and we'll use a strong tag for this. So we'll write annual plan. Then next up, we'll use a P tag and we'll write out 59.99 slash year and we'll hit save. If we go back to our design, we can see that we also want to add this change link right here. Right below our plan description container, we're going to write an A tag. So we'll say A, and this is linking to nowhere for now since we're just focusing on styles and HTML. And then inside of it, we'll write change. If we go back to our browser and refresh, we can see that we have the HTML that we want. I'm also going to zoom out a little bit so we can see everything better. Okay, so we have the HTML that we want, but this isn't looking so good. So let's add some styles. First, let's work on the plan container. Back over here above our buttons, we'll say plan container. And first we're going to give it the correct font size of 16 pixels. Then we're going to give it the background color of that kind of light purple that we saw. Uh, the app calls it blue, but to me it looks much more purple. So we'll say very pale blue and we'll hit save. Next, we'll give this container some padding. So we'll give it 25 pixels of padding. And then finally, we'll give it a border radius because if you notice in the design, the borders are a little bit rounded. So we'll say border radius of 12 pixels. If we go back and refresh, this is looking a bit better. However, we need to get these things all lined up. The next thing we'll do is add display flex. The flex property sets the flexible length on flexible items. The next thing we're going to do is say flex direction of row. If we go back to our app and hit refresh, we can see this is looking much closer to the design. Lastly, we want to add justify content space between. The justify content property defines how the browser distributes space between and around content items. Space between is a value that will distribute the content evenly, which is what we need. We also want to write out a line item center. This will align our items to the center. If we go back to our app and hit refresh again, we can see things are looking much better. The justify content property with the value of space between allowed us to evenly space out these items how we want them. Next up, let's work on our A tag. If we go back to our design, our A tag, or in other words, the tag that has the content of change inside of it, looks a little bit different than what we currently have. So let's add some styles to fix that. So let's write out plan container A, and we'll add some styles here. First, we'll add the color. So var bright blue. Next up, we'll add the font size, which is 13 pixels. And we'll add the font weight of 700. And we'll hit save. If we go back and refresh, we can see that our A tag is looking much better. Next up, we can add the hover state. So when you hover over this change A tag, it actually changes color. Again, we'll use opacity. So we'll say plan container a hover and we'll give it an opacity of 0 0.8. We'll also give it a text decoration of none. We wanted to add text decoration none because when you hover over this link, there is actually no underline underneath the link anymore. If we go back to our app and we refresh, we can see this is looking much better. Next up, we can see that our annual plan text right here is very faint. But if we go back to the design, it looks much more bold. Let's give it the correct color. So we'll say plan container strong. So we are selecting the strong tag and we'll say color var dark blue and we'll hit save. Next up, if we look at our app so far, we can see that everything inside of this white space, inside of this container we created, is not looking exactly like the design. 
we need to kind of center things here and make them look a bit better. Let's go add some styles to do this. Back in our container div that we created, we're going to add a display flex, which we talked about earlier. We're going to give it a flex direction of column. Next, we want to center the content. So we'll say justify content center. We'll also center the text on our page. So we'll say text align center as well. Lastly, we want to say font size of 18 pixels. If we go back and refresh, this is looking much better and much closer to the design. Awesome. Something else we'll notice is that in the design, this card is in the center of the page, but here it's just hanging out off to the left. So let's go back and fix that. We'll go back to the styles for our card and we'll say margin 50 pixels auto. Now, when you have just two values here, the 50 pixels is going to be for the top and the bottom of the div and auto is going to be for the left and the right. That is auto will be applied on the left and the right of the div and the 50 pixels will be applied on the top and the bottom. You might be wondering why are we using auto right here? When we say margin auto for the left and the right margins of an element, equal margin is given on either side of that element. And so this is how we can center our card in the middle of the page. If we refresh, we can see that our card is now centered. Okay, this is looking so close to the design. Let's go back over the design and see if there's anything that we're still missing. If we go back to the design, we can see that there is a bit more space here between the annual plan and the price than we have in our current application. It also looks like the annual plan and the price are a little bit closer to the music icon than they are to the change link. So let's make these changes really quick. Let's add some styles to our plan description, which is the container for the annual plan and the price. First, we'll give a line height of 20 pixels. And the next, we're going to give a margin right of 75 pixels, and we'll hit save. If we go back to our app and refresh, we can see that this is looking much better. Okay, so we are all done. We have officially finished this course. We have learned HTML and CSS from scratch, and we've built our very first app. We've built an order summary component that you can use in your developer portfolio. Thank you so much for watching this course.